to welcome three former justices and one current justice of the Ohio Supreme Court. On behalf of the Moyer Legacy Committee, please welcome Committee Chair Steve Stover, former Administrative Director of the Supreme Court, Ohio, Supreme Court of Ohio, to introduce our speakers. Steve, welcome. Thank you, Deborah. <clears throat> and uh, by the way, she's a former judge also. Uh, and thanks to the Columbus Metropolitan Club for inviting the Chief Justice Moyer Committee to sponsor this event. As a member of CMC, I'm honored that the Columbus Metropolitan Club will host four of the first five events of the Chief Justice Thomas Moyer Lecture Series. And we just happen to be in view of the building that bears his name, the Thomas J. Moyer Ohio Judicial Center, the white building on the river that you can see from here. We're also delighted to have 10 members of the Moyer Legacy Committee here today, and we just had a meeting this morning to talk about future forums like this. Many of you knew Tom Moyer, a great Chief Justice, a leader, a facilitator, and a mentor. The Legacy Committee was formed in 2010 to provide a lasting memorial to Chief Justice Moyer's dedication to the administration of justice, public understanding of the law, including uh, legal and civic education, dispute resolution, ethics, civility, judicial independence, and the rule of law. The uh, Moyer Committee has accomplished much in 11 years, <clears throat> including establishing and funding the Chief Justice Moyer Professorship for the Administration of Justice and the Rule of Law at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law, creating a, a fellowship program to provide research opportunities for students at Ohio's nine law schools, hosting a 2013 event featuring retired United States Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, a great friend of the chief, who delivered an address on civics education and civility, founding the Ohio Civility Consortium, a statewide collaboration of groups supporting civility and public discourse, and Deborah Price and Yvette were both uh, participants in that, and establishing this Chief Justice Moyer lecture series to present high quality lectures featuring noteworthy speakers to advance public discussion of the important issues of the day. Our first event was the announcement of the Congressional Civility Caucus by Steve Stover, or Stivers. We get ourselves confused a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm, I'm confused. <clears throat> and then we had uh, a uh, former White House counsel, John Dean, and we also had uh, uh, U.S. Court of Appeals Judge Jeffrey Sutton, and we also hosted a program at the Cleveland City Club in 2018. Well, the genesis of today's program is Justice Patrick Fisher's uh, project to interview all of the former mem the living former members of the Supreme Court of Ohio. And it's a pretty, um, uh, pretty amazing project. And uh, it also is creating a piece of living history about the Supreme Court. And all of today's panelists have been part of that effort. And so now I hope you will welcome today's panel, the Honorable Yvette McGee Brown, former Justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio, a partner with Jones Day, and a founding member of the Moyer Legacy Committee, the Honorable Herbert R. Brown, former Justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio, who was elected to the Supreme Court with Chief Justice Tom Moyer and served with him, the Honorable Mary D. Gennaro, former Justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio, who has worked tirelessly with the Moyer Committee on issues of civility and public discourse, and our host, the Honorable Patrick Fisher, Justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio, and also a founding member of the Moyer Committee. You can learn more about today's speakers in your forum flyer, and please see the Moyer Committee handout on your table. Justice Fisher, we look forward to a great conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, we're just going to get started here, although I have to tell you, Steve, I tried calling you this morning on the voice recognition on the car and sent my phone call to Steve Stivers. <laughs> true, true story. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna start at that end. 
with just former Justice De Janeiro. What did you learn while you were on a when, while you were a Supreme Court justice that you didn't know about the Supreme Court until you were appointed to it? Okay, so two things very quickly. First, one of my favorite places is the law library. It's a beautiful place if you want to quietly uh, work. Uh, it's inspirational space, so pack up your laptop. The librarians would love to see you. And the librarians would seasonally decorate the, the display of books behind them by season. So they had like patriotic things for the summer. Um, they had whimsical things for the spring. So it was really gratifying to see um, those professionals express their um, creativity. And I was very impressed. So all you Pinterest fans out there, check it out. I believe the court posts it on the website. So. Um, Something that I learned more about and appreciated as a justice, uh, when I was there, I made sure I walked around the building and visited all the different um, uh, departments because the court, that building is so much more than just the Supreme Court docket. And I spent um, about an hour or so with the, the men and women that worked in the Lawyers Fund for Client Protection. And in my view, they had the toughest job in the building. Part of our fees for as to maintain our, our license in Ohio is we make a contribution to that fund um, and that is to try to at least provide some financial compensation to clients that have been uh, harmed by uh, their lawyers. And talk about a tough job, um, day in and day out reading heartbreaking stories about how our brothers and sisters, mem certain members of the bar, uh, grossly uh, failed to live up to honor their oath and grossly failed um, their clients. And so they were sharing me with me some of the stories they, they had to review and decide who they could help financially and who they could not, knowing full well that um, financial compensation is not the whole um, piece of the story. And I, I, so I salute them because it was somebody for those victims um, of a less than perfect legal system to like have somebody hear their story. Um, so that was something light and something a little more serious that I learned in my tenure. Thank you. Uh, Justice McGee Brown, should state judges be elected or appointed? <laughs> and why? Thanks, Justice. <laughs> <laughs> Good questions for the good people. Oh, thank you, yeah. Um, you know, and, and we've talked about this before. I think there is no perfect system, right? Um, I think for many voters in Ohio, they don't know anything about the people that they elect to the bench. And so there are, there has been a clamoring to say, we should do something more. We should appoint justices. But then, in my opinion, you'd have to have a lot of safeguards, because when you do that, you're simply making the electorate smaller. <laughs> so you, you take the politics out of it and you give it to a small group of people who then make the decision, and those decisions may or may not be based on merit. I think there is a way to do it. The Chief Justice, before he died, was looking at a way that we could make sure that there were people um, with the right um, acumen, intellect, temperament, to serve on the Supreme Court, and then you would have some kind of uh, bipartisan commission that would approve them and maybe do something like California does with a retention vote. So there are a number of states who do it different ways. I think every way that you do it has um, some risk, but right now the way we're doing it, I think we might want to do it a little better. Thank you. Justice Herb Brown. Lots of Browns on the Ohio Supreme <laughs> Court over the years. I had a t-shirt, or not a shirt, when I ran, uh, because the newspaper editors always said, well, you're running because your name's Brown. And uh, there were eight Browns who had run for the court, four won and four lost. <laughs> and I, I wore that to uh, silence that argument. <laughs> well, you've been off the bench the longest of the three on the panel today. What are you doing today? Is there life after the Supreme Court? Well, there is for me. Uh, I've been writing plays. Catco's done a bunch of them. And uh, I'm going to have a new play produced in February around President's Day. It's uh, about Warren Harding, his women, his wife, who was instrumental in uh, getting him elected. It's a historic comedy. It's going to be done up at the Abbey Theater in Dublin around President's Day. So there is life. There is life. Okay. 
Justice DeGeneres, please tell the audience what the black bottle is and why, what goes in it and why it's important, if any. Ah, the black bottle, if I remember right, my number was seven. Uh, each justice has a number, and in order to keep the workflow balanced, um, like the, the bottle like has a, a life. So let's say that the day you, we gather for conference, um, all the prior opinions have been assigned, and all seven members are eligible um, to be assigned a majority opinion to write it if they are in the majority. So we discuss the case, take a, a preliminary vote, and then all of the justices who were with the majority, their, their number goes in the bottle. The uh, senior associate justice at the time, and in my tenure that was Terry O'Donnell, would shake the bottle, and the uh, justice to his immediate right, and again, when I was there, that was uh, Judy French, uh, he would shake the, the num the, uh, a, uh, a pill out of the bottle, and whoever's number came up, that was who was um, assigned to write that particular opinion. Then your number stays out of the bottle until, uh, no matter how much you vote in the majority, until everybody has been assigned a majority opinion and the process starts all over again. Was the one who controlled the bottle when I was on the court, and I always thought he had his thumb on the scale because I mean, because <laughs> my number came out on some cases I really didn't want to write. <laughs> Funny how that works out. That does happen. It's like, oh, please, I don't want this case. Please, I don't want this case. You always get to laugh the bottle, and in in my era, we had two occasions. The throat of the bottle is larger than the diameter of the ball. So you have to cover the throat with your thumb, the justice that's doing that. And on a couple occasions, that justice who was Asher Sweeney failed. <laughs> and the balls went scattering over the floor. And uh, it's not too seemly to see the seven justices scrambling to get the balls back in the bottle. <laughs> but I would also like to pay tribute to the bottle. And when I first was elected, I read a book by Bob Woodward on the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court does not use a bottle and balls to assign the opinions. The way they do it is that the senior justice in the majority assigns the opinion. And I think the black bottle is far superior to that <laughs> because if you read the book, that there's power in the ability to assign opinions. And if you get on the wrong side of the justice who's senior in the majority, you may be writing Indian Affairs opinions and not be considered for the big public cases. And the other thing in the U.S. Supreme Court, justices acquire a kind of an expertise. Justice William O. Douglas was considered an expert on um, antitrust law. And it seems to me that all seven judges have to vote. And it's a good thing to assign opinions to someone who may not be an expert in that case. So uh, that's a little ode to the black bottle. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Her. Uh, the randomness creates yeah. interest in every case. Yeah, and well, one other thing. The, the first time we were in, Justice Moyer got a tort case that I wanted to write, and I got a commercial paper case that I didn't want to, I hated it in law school, and we agreed to swap. Uh, and the other justices stopped us cold on that, and rightly Glad because that. that would lead, a swapping system could lead to a lot of problems. All, all I know, my luck has been running a lot heavier on Dormant Minerals Act cases oh, for God. some reason, <laughs> which is okay. I, I've, I've already taken oil and gas, so it's okay, but. After a while, you get a little tired of it. Um, who's next? Uh, Herb, does oral argument matter? And to what extent? Yeah. Uh, I think it does, and that was something that I didn't think as a lawyer. Um, because the cases, all of, a lot of them, most of them, are very close. Uh, the court does not review to make right every court of appeals decision. They review cases of great 
public and general interest that would affect a lot of people where you have maybe different decision in one state and another and, and, and so forth. And they are close and you find yourself sometimes switching opinions. You can watch maybe a judge is sitting there quietly while another justice is questioning or grilling the lawyer and you evaluate that. Maybe the lawyer is getting the better of that argument and you might uh, vote accordingly. So uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect all the cases. It would be a small minority, but there are cases and as a lawyer you have to assume that your argument can affect cases because in a percentage of them it does. And I think, I was gonna say, I think what's also important about that is when you're arguing your case, you're often only thinking about the facts of your case, but the court is writing law for the entire state. And so what's important for the advocate and for the justices actually, is we need to see how your theory of the case, the proposition of law that you're supporting is going to apply in a fact situation different from yours. And so oftentimes during oral argument, we are teasing that out of you. So we may change a fact or two because it's important that the rule of law we write isn't just so narrowly focused on your case, but has broad application. As Justice Brown said, it has to apply and be able to be applied to all of the, the citizens of this state. And I would like to echo those comments. Uh, and the best oral advocates uh, in front of the Supreme Court and at the courts of appeals understand that nuance. It's not just your case. It's how it's going to impact the whole state um, even at the appellate level. And I encourage all the um, lawyers out there, never, never waive oral argument. I can't tell you over the course of my judicial career, um, especially at the appellate level, and this is a sentiment amongst all uh, the appeals judges. There were cases when we were conferencing, it's like I wish the parties had um, opted for oral argument because I had a question about this or I had a question about that. I wanted to tease this out. So never give up that opportunity. And uh, you don't have to use the whole 15 minutes, remember. Um, if you've got a cold bench or you you're reading the room and you're not feeling the love, say, you know, are there any more questions? And then sit down, but never, because you do not want to second guess yourself and think, what if? Behind the scenes too, just one more Justice Fisher, is that when we read the cases and the, we read the briefs, we come out and we think we know how our colleagues are gonna vote. And it's so interesting because I'm, you know, I'm ready for bear, man. I'm like, this is how I think on this case and I know I'm gonna have to, you know, wrestle some other votes. And then, <laughs> then as you get into the questioning, you start hearing questions that like, oh, they, they think the same way too. And so it's a really a great way, that the way you think people are gonna decide a case as you start to hear their questions is very different. And so it's also a good time, I would always say to lawyers that sometimes we are arguing amongst ourselves on the bench and using you as the prop. So we'll be, we'll be asking you questions because we wanna torpedo the argument we heard two seats down, so. <laughs> And if you listen to the U.S. Supreme Court oral arguments yeah. on the audio, you can tell they're arguing with each other, not really asking questions. That's right. It's just <laughs> hilarious. Um, how about this one, Justice McGee Brown? How did you go along in deciding cases? What processes did you follow in general, not all the time, but in general, to decide a case? Um, well, I had really good clerks who would um, write a, a memo telling me their opinion of the law, and I was really good at hiring clerks who weren't like-minded, right? So I would have a clerk that I thought would think a lot like me, I'd have a clerk who I thought would think very differently than me, and then I had one that was in the middle. But what I would always do is I'd read the briefs, sometimes I'd start with the, um, the appellee's brief first and then go back and read the appellant's brief. And depending on what the subject was, like if it was a utilities case, boy, I started those first thing in the morning because you do not want to read utility law in the afternoon. It's impossible. <laughs> and then, <laughs> And, and then for some cases, you know, the case law is pretty clear, precedent that the court has decided. But on some cases, I'd really ask my clerks to go back and look at what other states have done on a particular issue, look and see if there's any kind of majority holding on the issue that we're deciding, and then um, wait and hear what the lawyers have to say. Anybody else on that? Anybody else want to talk about that? 
Um, Mary? I, I would, I, I'm a little more linear, so I would read the briefs in order. Um, I would also like, I would also make sure I looked at the uh, trial court um, decision, uh, the Court of Appeals decision, just to, to give it a little more context. And uh, like Yvette, um, on the Court of Appeals and at the Supreme Court, I told my clerks, I need you to um, advocate for your position and um, push back if you think I'm going down a wrong path, path as a matter of law. Um, because, you know, if I was just gonna, if I was looking for yes men, I wouldn't hire law clerks and I would do it all myself. So the interaction with uh, the law clerks are helpful. My experience is there was also conversation among the law clerks um, with different chambers, uh, conversations among the justices, talking about a case. Um, so it's it's just a, a great um, intellectual feast to, to, to talk through cases. have a lot of power. You yes, know, the, they law, do. the law clerks would come, my clerks would come and say, well, Justice so and so might join your opinion if you change, if you could change these two sentences. <laughs> the scoop. Yeah. Anything, Herb, or just let it go? Uh, well, I, I agree with. What, what's been said. Well, Lynn, I'll give you a different question. This, this was a question I was asked a few months ago. A woman came up to me and said, Justice, I know you're on the Supreme Court, and, but it's just, I never see anything in the newspaper or on mass media about the Ohio Supreme Court. Why do you guys matter? Oh, well. <laughs> Let me start, that's a long one. I could be all afternoon <laughs> on that. Um, First of all, 90% of what's taught in law school is resolved by state Supreme Courts. Personal injury, how your estate is distributed, everything that people do. The U.S. Supreme Court is really confined to interstate commerce and federal constitutional law. That's one course in law school. So the law that governs people's lives is made in the Ohio Supreme Court for Ohioans. And uh, I think that's uh, ex uh, significant. Mary? I think it's a missed opportunity. Um, so to the folks in the media, I would encourage you to um, take this opportunity to cover the court more and present it to the viewers as an opportunity to um, enhance civic um, education for the reasons that um, Justice Brown articulated you know, the state courts really have so much more impact on, on people's really real lives. And it would be a great counterbalance to what, what, what is the perception of a vast majority of the public of the legal profession and what goes on in our courtrooms day in and day out. It's all those um, iterations of judge shows on TV. Sadly, we have um, moved very far from kind, wise, civil Judge Wapner. Um, so that gives um, the public a, a very um, unrealistic perception about what goes on in our courtrooms and makes them more um, cynical. Um, so I think this is a great opportunity to cover what the court does uh, more um, to like dispel a lot of those myths. Is that anything you want to add? Well, yeah, I, th I think that, that the judicial system, the Supreme Court, there's a reason we have three branches of government, and I think it is hugely important, not only because of the impact it has on e everyday citizens, but also because it is the check and balance on the other two branches of government, and we need to make sure that we have courts. I mean, the thing is, if, if courts ever are perceived as not having legitimacy, democracy ends. I mean, we live in a country where people respect the rule of law. And I think that is the importance of the Supreme Court in this state and every state. Going back, uh, Justice Herb Brown, is there a case that you remember that's most special or of importance to you? Maybe something you wrote or something you dissented in? Or? Yeah, uh, well, the one that comes quickly to mind, although there were a lot of cases, I think, was <clears throat> where we ruled the uh, uh, statute of repose unconstitutional. Well, let me back up. The statute of limitations, as you may know, gives a plaintiff a certain amount of time after they discover that their injury 
to bring a lawsuit or they lose the right. A statute of repose has nothing to do with that, but it says after a number of years, you can't bring a lawsuit even if you don't know that you were injured. It could be medical malpractice, that's what the one that I wrote was. Uh, it could be a bridge. You could have serious errors in engineering in a bridge. The statute of repose might be 10 years, 11th year, the bridge collapses. There is no right to sue if the statute of repose is upheld. Now it's an interesting case because states differ on this. The, the law is not all one way. Our case was 4-3 and I'm not even sure I would vote the same way uh, if it came up again because there are good public policy arguments. But the Ohio Constitution requires the court to be open for injury to person, property, and so forth. And it seems to me it's, the courts are not open if your case is barred before you found out you had one. Uh, and uh, so I thought that was, it also illustrates the kind of case that the court takes in. It's a real misconception to think, as many people do, even lawyers, that the court's there to make right all the wrong court of appeals decisions. It's not. It's to hear cases like this that affect a lot of different cases and where the law might be split between uh, one state and another or even one county and another. So looking, oh, and one footnote on that. Uh, this actually comes up rather rarely that you would go 10 years before you found a defect in a bridge. But the insurance companies didn't miss that little wrinkle. <laughs> they came out strong after this opinion made the newspaper that unfortunately we're gonna have to raise the rates for doctors because the court has unleashed this flood of plaintiff's litigation. And in the whole term of six years, I never saw another case where the malpractice was barred by the statute or would have been barred by a statute of repose. So I thought that was a little bit of grandstanding. Mary, anything? Any case? Um, so another light had a, a light note. Um, it was a tax case that Justice Fisher and I uh, disagreed on, but it was kind of a fun case because it involved at what point do giveaways um, at a professional sports event get taxed? And this involved um, the Cincinnati uh, Reds, and I'm sorry, I can't talk about this case without bobbling my head because it involved <laughs> bobbleheads, bobbleheads. And um, the, the, the public affairs department of, our, of the court did a very adorable job of you know, covering that case. They had a bunch of bobbleheads lined up and there's the court behind the screen. We're sitting on the bench being so serious. Um, but I particularly like that case because Justice Fisher gave a lovely homage to the history of baseball in the opinion. And um, I kind of liked it because it kind of, you know, no offense to tax lawyers and accountants out there, that it can be a little dry read. Um, but that was an opportunity to like make the court, pro it, uh, professionally in my opinion, and appropriately a little more relatable um, to the public and kind of get you in to read this opinion. So that's my lighthearted, my, my substantive opinion. Um, is my um, dissents mean a lot to me. I've heard countless judges say when I, I think it's, you know, because the general theory is people um, are very circumspect about when they decide to dissent in a case or not, and those tend to be a little more personal. And, you know, lawyers are um, inspired by Atticus Finch. And I remember early in my judicial career going to a um, seminar and Justice Scalia was the speaker, and he was talking about in defense of dissents, and where would the rule of law be um, if there was not a, dis a dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson um, or the Korematsu case? You know, law is to be built incrementally, and dissents are part of that process. So that inspired me to um, 
the value to the broader rule of law um, for dissent. So my dissent on the court was in a case out of the 8th District, State versus Jackson. Um, it involved um, um, the, the Cuyahoga County um, Children's Services prosecutor and the police department had an agreement where they had a social worker who would interview inmates as part of the team for investigating, you know, alleged, you know, crimes against children. And in this particular case, uh, the defendant had been interviewed by the police, exercises Miranda rights, and um, interviewed by the social worker and made incriminating statements that was used against him in trial and he was convicted. The 8th District reversed, indicating that that violated his uh, Fifth Amendment protections. And I was the lone vote um, saying in that case, because the court basically issued a bright line rule, and I said, no, this is, you need to make a case-by-case -case, uh, determination. Um, and given the facts of this case, um, it was, his, his rights were violated. And uh, the criminal space is always uh, tough for judges. Um, the prosecutor side of a case is always super popular, real easy to uh, get behind because they're putting away the bad guys and the bad gals, right? But, you know, there is, we have those constitutional protections for a reason and judges have to protect those rights. So even though I was the lone vote, I felt that that viewpoint had to be articulated and we'll see where the case law goes in that space. I, this is not this is not really about the Ohio Supreme Court, but I don't know if you, if you saw the article in Sunday's New York Times, Louisiana uh, just posthumously exonerated um, Mr. Plessy, who was the plaintiff in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson. And to your point about the one dissent, for those of you that are not lawyers, Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, the United States Supreme Court, decided that separate but equal was constitutional in this country. And it took from 1896 to 1954 for that decision to be overturned in Brown versus Board of Education. What's interesting and what made me think about it when you said this, Mary, is that there was one dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson on the United States Supreme Court, one dissent. Um, and that dissent was the proper rule. If you read the United States Constitution, there is nothing in the United States Constitution that says separate but equal can be the law of this land. And as I read that article and, and hearing you say about the one dissent, just think about where our country would be right now if we had not ensconced into law separate but equal. Just think about that. And so sometimes that one voice can be proven right. It may take you know, generations after their decease. But I think when you are a justice, you have to rule in the principled way in which you interpret uh, the Constitution and the laws. Thank you. And to your point of it about one and courage, you know, that was the great John Marshall Harlan, the great dissenter. So fast forward to the mid-30s in the Korematsu case, three justices dissented. So how did the tradition of uh, John Harlan and Plessy inspire them to speak up because for them to dissent in Korematsu, you know, during the, the course of the Second World War, um, took courage. We have one more question from me and then we're gonna go to the audience, okay? And I should say on the tax case that uh, Justice DeGeneres mentioned, at the end of the first section of our opinions, you always say who won the case. I quoted, Red, uh, in the opinion, I quote Red's Hall of Fame announcer, Marty Brenneman, this one belongs to the Reds. <laughs> anyway, this is for all three of you, and we'll start with Yvette this time. Right now, under the Ohio Constitution, the only qualification to become a judge or Supreme Court justice is that the person be a lawyer for six years, not less than six years under the Constitution. Should there be other qualifications, additional years for different levels, why and what constitutes a year of practice? 
So you asked me, this is, a, I got elected first as a common pleas court judge with seven years experience, so I can't really throw stones. <laughs> and I served on, on the trial court for nine years. But I do think for the Ohio Supreme Court, there ought to be a higher bar than six years. There ought to at least be a, a minimum, I would think, of 10 years of the practice of law. Many people are lawyers who never practice because you're deciding important cases and you need to understand the legal issues that you'll grapple with. And so I think at a minimum, you should have at least 10 years experience practicing law um, before you can be a Supreme Court justice. Well, I, I'm a little bit on the other side of that. Um, I think the system's working pretty well. You don't have people coming on the court with six years of experience. And I think once you get into uh, what is practice, and so forth, you could get into a hotbed of controversy. And uh, I would say this, that uh, maybe not many people know it, but to be on the US Supreme Court, you don't even have to be a lawyer. And so I think the system is functioning pretty well as it is. Uh, and I think it could be a can of worms to try to lay out specific qualifications Last but not least, Mary. Okay, so I'm going to break the tie. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, I feel best. Panels of three always works, right? Um, I think that, quali to Herb's point, yes, no one that I can think of on the Supreme Court in my memory had the minimum requirements. Um, to Yvette's point, um, I, I think the, the, um, there should be an increase to the number of years of practice. I think with good conversation, you can kind of delineate what practice, uh, what the practice of law means. Um, I remember um, a number of years ago, Chief Justice Moyer set up a bunch of uh, different working groups, and one of his aspirations was looking at uh, length of practice um, for each level of the bench and also extending the terms um, of each level of the bench. Um, and. I, I agree with the vet, and I recall her her CV. She was an active practitioner at the trial court level, so the fact that she had been in the practice, active practice for seven years, makes sense. Um, but it should be more than six years, um, eight to ten, ten for the trial court level, and you you're going to want people that actively are litigating in state courts um, that have developed those skill sets to answer quickly. The appellate level, the Supreme Court level, there should be a, a, a number of years. Um, I practiced for 14 years before I ran for the uh, Court of Appeals. Because the thing with judging, it's not just your knowledge and your skills as lawyers. There's that component of wisdom. And you can be crackerjack, whip smart, like all those uh, young men and women that get the primo job out of law school, which is a SCOTUS law clerk, right? Unquestionably, some of the brightest folks walking the planet. But they haven't had the opportunity to develop wisdom and sitting in judgment of people. It's a very sobering thing. Any lawyer in the room will tell you that when you go to court and you have to represent a client, it's sobering. You've got people's lives in their hands. Custody matters, estates, business relationships, those are in our hands. And I think an important component of being a judge is getting some miles on the tires and some life experience so you develop that skill set of wisdom. Because, you know, Supreme Court justices, appellate justices, they have the luxury of time and reflection. It's like being in law school and grading your own papers, right? But trial court judges, they got to keep the trains moving, okay? And some of the toughest jobs are your muni judges. They, they, they can't, they've got to make those decisions um, the best they can in that moment. And so that's why I think you need a longer time in the practice to develop that skill set. Now, it is CMC's longstanding tradition to take audience questions. Doug Buchanan of CMC is curating questions from the live stream audience. It's back there. For our in-house audience, please join Doug at the microphone. Please keep your questions brief and to the point. <laughs> Doug, what's our first question? 
Justice Fisher, thank you very much. Our first question is from our live stream audience. Trip Lazarus asked, I know it's not supposed to happen, but in reality, how big of a role do the personal political opinions of the justices impact their decisions? Well, Herb, we'll let you do that one first. I, I think one misconception is that it's all political, and I, I personally am opposed to putting the label on judges running. It doesn't tell you anything about the judge, but what party uh, they are in. Um, but give me your question again. I, I forgot what my, I'm, I'm getting up to the age where I forget things. Uh, um, uh, Trip Lazarus asked, I know it's not supposed to happen, but in reality, how big of a role do the personal political opinions of the yeah, justice? I got it now. Most of the cases on the, that come before the court are not political. Maybe there are labor cases, workers come, but there's no political element to d interpreting a contract or a personal injury. Uh, and so this idea that the, the judges are all political is not right. And uh, in the court that I served on, there were combinations often between Republicans, Democrats. Actually, the most liberal person on the court was a Republican. And the, the most liberal person on criminal law and the death penalty was also a Republican. So I think that's a stereotype that applies in a small group of cases, but not generally. Mary? I, I agree. It's because uh, otherwise, when there were seven Republicans, all the decisions would be 7 0. If they were all Democrats, they would be 7 0. As Herb alluded to, any number of, of combinations. And it's more a function of uh, a justice's you know, judicial philosophy and things like that, but not politics. That's how externals want to frame it. Do that? Anything? No, I, I agree with that. I think that we all come to the bench with with a philosophy, and, but as you decide more and more cases, I, everybody looks at the law, and I was the only Democrat on my court, and I can tell you that I never felt the cases broke down by any political ideology. I would battle with, um, with everybody, and sometimes I'd win, sometimes I would lose, but it was always on the law. From our audience. I'm Carol Looper, and my question, not intentionally, follows that line. Now on the ballot, there will be the political party for the Supreme Court judges and the appeals court judges, not all of the other judges. Why is that happening, and how do you feel about that? Yvette? Yeah. So, listen, I, um, <laughs> I actually uh, don't have a problem with it. I think it's ridiculous to say that you know, judges aren't endorsed by political parties. We're endorsed by political parties. We receive money from political parties. And then suddenly when it comes to the ballot, we don't want to have political identification on there. So what hap the reason for it, I think, at the trial court level is because those lawyers are from the community. It's a lot easier for people to make a decision about the lawyers who are running for judge. When you get to the appellate court and the Supreme Court, People don't know who those people are, and so some people do vote because they, they recognize a certain name. It sounds familiar to them. I think when people see a D or an R, people who are not familiar with judges are going to make a decision based on what they think that person's disposition is going to be. Um, unless we can come up with a better way to educate the community, and we've tried with the, uh, we've got websites, but people simply don't take the time. They call their friends who are lawyers and say, who should I vote for? So it's just one more marker, I think, to give people an opportunity to determine if this is somebody they would like to have, because they'll see the commercials. The commercials are 15 or 30 seconds. You can't learn about somebody in that time period. And as, you know, a, one of my friends always says, the most important, important decision you make about a judge is on election day. You don't want to find out about your judge the day you're in front of them. You want to find out about your judge when you're voting for them. Mary, uh, we're, we're starting to run out of time, so okay. Mary. I'm going to say I agree with uh, Yvette's assessment as well. Doug? The other side of that. Okay. <laughs> I seem to be the dissenter here today. Uh, putting the label on doesn't tell you anything about that judge other than what party she or he belongs. And it's introducing a political element that I don't think belongs. But it's there. 
but it's, it's there. And if you look at the statewide numbers for the elect executive offices, you know, the Republican and Democrat candidates in all the races don't get the same vote each and every time. It, as Yvette indicated, it is just a factor. Chief Justice O'Connor got the judicial votes counts thing rolling, so that's an objective place for people to inform themselves. Other communities have it, but um, it is a factor, not yeah, this is, yeah. Next question, Doug. Uh, our, we'll try to get in two more but questions. For what more. reason? The only additional fact is they know it's a Democrat or Republican, and I think that's a bad reason. Our next question is, uh, Hugo Trucks asks, uh, do you feel, in general, are Ohio laws well or poorly written? <laughs> I, I'll take that one myself. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding you. I've spoken to the Speaker and to the President of the Senate that the Legislative Services Commission, they need to take a lesson in grammar. <laughs> I, I'm serious. It's, it's just because, it, yeah, c because... They're trying to do things, and a lot of times the legislation is a compromise, so it is hard on them, I agree. But basic grammar, you know, back to eighth grade grammar or something would help. Anyway, that's just me. We're going to go on. Frank Reed. Thank you, Justice Fisher. Uh, first, I want to say I used to work for Justice Herb Brown in 1990, so I've been privileged to be a lawyer 31 years. It was a great experience. Um, each of you know, having served on the Ohio Supreme Court, that so many of your cases never see the day of light. In other words, there's only 6% of cases that are accepted for jurisdiction by a vote of uh, four justices of, uh, on the Ohio Supreme Court out of seven who agreed that it's the, a case of great or public importance. How often is it that you see a motion for reconsideration granted on a jurisdictional, and what was it that convinced you, yes, this is a case we ought to be hearing? Hey, <laughs> uh, you <re> <laughs> I can't even think of a time we did a motion for reconsideration on a jurisdictional. Um, for me, I always looked at whether it was of great public or general interest or was there a constitutional issue. If we've, uh, many a times those motions for jurisdiction, it's one court. And so if it's, if it's one appellate court that's made a bad decision, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna take the case. So I'm looking at its broader application. Herb? Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's very rare. That that's done. I'll ditto that. Frank, it is rare, but lately we've had more of them. I, l last year we had two, which what's is... Going on with what's going on? I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I, I didn't vote for them either time, but... I, my view is, if you, if you voted, if you were in the dissent and somebody files a motion to reconsider, you still have to go unless they raise a new issue with the majority, but others disagree. And they'll, they'll, they will dissent again. And they'll say, yeah, grant the reconsideration because they were in the in the minority, and I, I don't agree with that. But anyway, next question, Doug. Thank you, uh, Melissa Fisher asks, uh, has there been a decision where you were in the majority, but you were disturbed by the consequences of the decision and the way it has been used in other cases? That requires research. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> well, they'll think about that one for a minute. Give them a minute. Next question. In the name of Allah, uh, first of all, hello and welcome, I say, to the self of four noble person who are, in fact, the representative of God and the scale of justice. Last week, I was your guest. Uh, with the organization of us together that handles all my legal paperwork and today uh, and today I would like uh, to express my special thanks to Miss Tony uh, for making me a wanted guest here with you Mrs. Jones the CEO she she is a very respectable lady uh, once again, I would like uh, to introduce myself. My name is Kais. Yeah. You have a question. My name is Kais Kakar. I'm from Afghanistan, and I'm one of refugee. 
Uh, so in fact, I'm civil engineer. I work with the with youth armies. Uh, my what? question is that. Uh, What are the solution way to bring immigrant families and how long will it take? Especially my family. I have two kids. One, one is uh, two years and the other is just uh, 45 days. Uh, they lived in Afghanistan. Can you explain for me? I, I don't know if we can answer that because we're all state, state judges and that's a really a federal immigration issue. I, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. We, have other, we have time for one more question. Doug? Thank you. Our last question will be from our online audience. Kathy Kendall asks, uh, and this, this uh, plays off an earlier question, but can we get an inside look at what goes on when the court is deciding whether to accept a case or decline it? It's a bad, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, um, and you guys do it differently now, I a think. Bit, yes, a bit. yeah. W when I was on there, you know, we'd get every two weeks, the court sits in two week uh, increments, we'd get a, a banker's box, which is files like this. We'd get four or five banker's boxes of cases with jurisdictionals in them. You'd read the, the um, request to accept jurisdiction, the request to deny jurisdiction. We'd all have our votes and we'd go in and, and we'd uh, vote. And if there weren't four votes, the justice who really wanted to have that case accepted would, you know, ask somebody else to change their vote or argue vociferously for their case. But it was all pretty civil. They do it differently now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it was. We do it slightly different. It, it, when I got there, it took 120 to 125 days to decide a motion for jurisdiction. We're now down to 70 to 75. What we do is it, it's sent out to all of us. We all vote on a Thursday, online really, electronically. On Friday, it's sent back out with the votes. And by Monday at noon, you have to tell the uh, reporter if you're holding the case for discussion at, at, at conference. That way, cases that are unanimously not going to get taken get moved on. So it, it works. The one thing I think people here should know, and you'd be proud of these justices and all the justices, um, this, the Thomas Moyer legacy includes a lot about civility. And the way we conduct our deliberations, the lawyers would be proud, the citizens would be proud. After oral argument, the chief we go up to this big room, chief speaks first, and then the most senior justice, and then me, and then goes down in seniority. But during that time, no one interrupts the speaker. So you can hear what everybody has to say. But then, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> no, it really doesn't. But, but it, 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 it really is a good time for debate, back and forth, and the chief waits for everybody to be kind of debated out, and then says we're gonna vote. And you vote in reverse from the most junior back to up to the most senior, and then the chief votes. And my belief is that was created so that the chief could break a tie, you know? And, and, and kind of control the court a little bit. That, that's about the only difference I see between chief's position other than administrative and, and the other justices on substantive law. But you would be proud because you don't hear people saying you're a jerk or, you know, what, like you see on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. People are very respectful of everybody else's opinions and viewpoints. And you, would, as Ohioans, I think you'd be proud of your Ohio Supreme Court. Thank you. Okay. And we now call upon Deborah Price to put the end to, to this. Deborah Price is Boss guys, <laughs> that's her. Yes, for better or worse. I did good, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I hope you found today's forum as fascinating as I did. Um, I'm really pleased to be among this group of people that were so important in my life through my career, and um, wish you the very, very, very best. I think it's. Um, I learned a lot, and even though I'm old school, I, there's always more to learn. 
Uh, I, I forgot to mention, we have a very special announcement today. We want to uh, welcome our n newest lifetime member, Louisa Birch Green. Louisa, are you here? Well, anyway, um, we all encourage you to consider lifetime memberships, too. It's really a great deal, and um, uh, you help our group, and you become part of us, really part of us. All right, next week we're going to take a break for Thanksgiving, but please make sure to join us on December 1st for a great presentation, uh, the Columbus Dispatch Editors Roundtable, uh, a collection of former editors of the Dispatch, which ought to be a uh, uh, great uh, historic reference for all of us as we uh, contemplate um, the news cycles and the history of our city all the way back to Mike Curtin and maybe before, I think. So um, thanks uh, to you all, all of you online. Your virtual presence is noted. We're so glad that you're with us uh, and to the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's forum. Thanks to our sponsors once again, Chief Justice Moyer's Legacy Committee, uh, Ice Miller, LLP, Carlisle Patch and Murphy, and Bob Weiler and Company. Thank you to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for our live streaming. And most of all, to our panel, Chief or Justice Yvette McGee Brown, Justice Herb Brown, Justice Mary DeGenero, and our host, Justice Pat Fisher. Thank you for joining us. We couldn't do this without you. We're looking forward to seeing you on December 1st as we present another community conversation. Thank you all.